King Solomon was one of the wisest men the face of the earth has ever been graced with. He is highly revered by some of the biggest religions humanity has ever known, and he is a man that I seek to live in the example of every day of my waking life. Not only was he able to acquire an obscene amount of wealth, but he was also able to transcend material desire and learn that a life of materialism is not in align with our divine purpose. He is highly revered not only in a broad Abrahamic theological sense, but also in wider esoteric and mystical societies. Today I would like to take us on a journey through Solomon's life and dissect the many convoluted ideas surrounding his legacy. Before we begin, I would ask that you please like the video and subscribe if you like seeing content like this, and you could even consider supporting me on Patreon through the first link in the description. Solomon was born to the great King David, along with his mother Bathsheba. The Christian and Muslim narrative debate as to whether or not Bathsheba was married at the time of Solomon's conception. The Bible states that she was married to a man named Uriah the Hittite, and David had arranged for him to be killed in war, and thus convicting David of adultery. The Quran, as in most cases with other prophets, exonerates David of this sin. Regardless of the details, Solomon was David's second son, and he was destined to become the great ruler we know today from his birth. You see, David made a very important covenant with God. He is quoted saying, Here I am living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. And he is, of course, talking about the ark of the covenant here. God admired David's desire to build the first temple, but he could not allow this to happen because he had the blood of many men on his hands. So instead, he promised that his son would be given this great privilege to build the first temple. And for many of you, this is just a refresher, but it's important that we discuss this and have this fresh on our minds so we can really understand just how beautifully this covenant was unpacked. In the biblical book of 2 Chronicles, shortly after taking the throne, Solomon has a dream, and in this dream, God approaches Solomon and asks him to make a wish, any wish he desires, in a real genie in the lamp kind of style. Solomon could have asked for anything, but he only asked for one thing. He says, give me the heart to discern between right and wrong and rule the people justly. God was so pleased with this answer that not only did he grant him this wish, but he also granted him all the fame and riches he could ever imagine. Now, if we return to the point that I was really trying to make us remember earlier, the covenant with David, it is very interesting to understand that God surely knew that Solomon would have asked for something noble. Whenever he asked him for anything he could desire, he of course had to know that he would ask him for this. This opens up a huge conversation on existentialism and free will, which Solomon himself addresses in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon highlights here the unfortunate irony of wisdom. A man that is truly wise realizes just how unintelligent he is in the grand scheme of creation. Wisdom is in fact a paradoxical idea in this sense. In order for someone to be wise, they cannot see themselves as such. To be granted the honor of wisdom means to be in a constant battle with your internal dialogue, viewing yourself objectively, while also subjectively. Solomon acquired a massive influence over his kingdom with his dominion stretching from the Euphrates River to the Philistines. And this rule would even extend into the world of the supernatural. This is perhaps one of the most popular talking points of Solomon's record. It does not appear in the Bible, but it does appear in the Islamic account. Solomon was said in the Quran to rule over humans, animals, and the jinn. The jinn are invisible creatures that existed both in pre-Islamic Saudi Arabia and persist within the Islamic belief of today. They are described as being created before mankind, created from a smokeless fire. They have the same kind of free will as humans and therefore are not inherently evil. However, many people have interpreted them as such probably because of Talmudic influences. Namely, a story in which the king of the demons, Ashmedai, cast Solomon into exile. Another text in the Gemara dismisses the idea of Solomon controlling supernatural entities altogether and instead says that he got control of the Shamir, which is a mysterious worm-like creature which he used to build the temple. Jewish theology does not consider demons as inherently evil. 
Their perception of these entities are very similar to the Islamic perception of the jinn, believing they are bound to the same sort of judicial system as humans and therefore they will also be judged accordingly. We discussed this at length in our video on Jewish demonology. However, because all of this is not common knowledge, many people have a skewed perception believing that Solomon solely controlled evil entities or demons. Regardless of what these beings were, Solomon is believed to have such great influence over them that he was able to instruct them to build many things throughout the city as well as the temple, an idea that is expanded upon by the Testament of Solomon. This is a pseudepigraphical text in which the Archangel Michael delivers a signet ring to King Solomon, which he uses to control them. This testament is often accompanied by the greater and lesser keys, two ancient grimoires that birth Solomonic magic. Solomon's legacy is very unique because of all the ideas aforementioned, he's able to survive simultaneously both in esoteric and holy circles. That is super, super interesting. He exists both as a literal figure and also as this archetype of sorts. In many cases, not being viewed for the actual things that he did, but rather the things that he was capable of doing. He was almost deified in this way. What with the many different ideas surrounding his existence, the many different opinions, most of them being held on purely by faith. To further express this point that I'm making, we should discuss the figure Hiram of Tyre, who appears in the book of First Chronicles. Solomon employs him as a master craftsman to build the bronze elements of the temple. Within Masonic lore, this man is known as Hiram Abiff. According to legend, he was brutally martyred when he refused to give up the secrets of a master Freemason after constructing the temple. He is honored highly within the group today, being seen as the central allegorical figure that is presented to Masons of the third degree. Now, is this chain of events coincidental? I wanna ask that question. Or is it possible that this is a direct manifestation of God's promise to sustain Solomon's fame for generations? The amount of material surrounding this man's life that exists in circles that are in such stark contrast to one another. The ability of this man's wisdom to find its way into the hearts of many men, regardless of their affiliations on this planet. This timeless wisdom is something that we seldom see within any other man. Again, this provides us with a sobering perspective on human sovereignty. Solomon has many works that have been ascribed to him, such as the pseudepigraphical books that we have just discussed, in order to give them a better sense of authority. But there are also many texts that are ascribed to King Solomon that are almost unanimously agreed as being of his genuine authorship. One such story is found in 1 Kings, in which Solomon is approached by two harlots who lived together and they both bore children. But one night, one of the women smothered a child in her sleep and allegedly she took her smothered child, who is dead, and swapped it out with the other mother's child who is alive. For whatever reason, no one was able to remember whose child was whose based strictly off appearance, so they brought this matter to King Solomon to judge. His solution came very quickly. He asked that they cut the child in half at once. That way, it was fair to both mothers. They each had a half of a child. Just before the incision was to be made, the true mother cried out, thus solving the issue. Solomon, of course, knew all along that the true mother would be revealed in this way. Another story that is found in the Quranic biblical, as well as even Jewish accounts, is King Solomon converting the Queen of Sheba to the true religion. In the biblical account, we are given only a brief description in which the Queen visits King Solomon after hearing of his great wisdom bearing gifts. In folk tales and the apocryphal Jewish rabbinic exegesis, she is described as having the legs of a donkey and a demon mother. In the Quran, this story is the most elaborate. Solomon has an assistant by his side at all times known as the Hoopo bird and this bird travels distantly and finds this kingdom where a queen is worshiping a sun god, and he brings this information back to Solomon. Solomon is very displeased with this, and he sends a message asking that she at once submit to the will of Allah. In response to this, she sends him a gift, which he is absolutely disgusted by because he has everything he could ever dream of. He doesn't want her gift. He wants her to submit to the will of Allah. He commands his chiefs to bring her to his palace, to which they do, and upon entering the foyer, she mistakes the crystal flooring for a body of water and thus bares her legs while lifting her dress. When Solomon tells her it is only crystal and not water, she replies, My Lord, I have certainly wronged my soul. Now I fully submit, along with Solomon, to Allah, the Lord of all worlds. And this is quite perplexing. Why would she submit only after she was tricked into bearing her legs? 
This leads us back to the exegesis aforementioned of her alleged donkey legs. There is even certain hadith which suggests that the jinn did not want Solomon to lust after her, and so told him that she had some very hairy legs or the legs of a donkey, whether it was metaphorical or literal, we're not sure, but that could also be the origin of this idea. While we are on the subject of Arabic tradition, I would like to discuss Shams al-Marif, or The Book of the Son of Gnosis, a 13th century grimoire which contains some very similar invocations that we see in the Greater and Lesser Keys, which were believed to have been authored around the same time. The Shams al-Marif contains very direct information on how one can channel the jinn to command them to do whatever they wish, and while it does not mention King Solomon directly, we can infer that some influence was taken from his legacy. Lastly, I would like to discuss the most popular first-person writings of Solomon, which are found in the biblical books of wisdom, namely Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, and Proverbs. Proverbs, being most famous, provides general information for living within the proper guidelines of a godly man. Many of these virtues closely echo Stoic sentiments, with certain verses rejecting hedonism in favor of discipline. The messages contained here are admirable regardless of affiliation. The Song of Songs is a lyric poem meant to emphasize the divine union between man and woman in holy matrimony. And lastly, we have the Book of Ecclesiastes, which I opened with an excerpt at the start of the video and discussed towards the middle of the video. And this is truly my favorite. I cannot stress enough just how beautifully designed it is. It gives us constant reminder that all material desire is futile, and the greatest thing man can do for himself is seek wisdom and enjoy the present moment. It reminds us that our existence here is but a transitory state, and we can never become too attached. The material surrounding this one man is seemingly endless, with a vast amount of exegesis appearing in the rabbinic midrash and countless interpretations of his words and actions appearing in almost every culture following his death. His words pervade through all belief systems. Few other men have held as much influence, as much knowledge. No matter what your goal in life or what you believe your purpose to be, we can all benefit in some way from King Solomon's words if we really truly open our heart to receive them. All men should seek to leave a lasting impact on the world they will leave behind whenever they pass on. This cannot be achieved through egotistical or material means. Rather, we should always remember that intimate moment in which Solomon was given the choice to ask the Creator himself for absolutely anything he could imagine. And if given the chance a million times over, he would continue to ask for the same thing. And that same thing was wisdom. Thank you for watching this video. If you would like to express your support for what I'm doing here, you can do so through my Patreon at the first link in the description. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and TikTok if you don't already. And I hope to welcome you back next time.